Welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate. I'm Will Tanaka. And I'm Leonie Lam. We are honored to be your host for Inside Hawaii Real Estate. Will is a full-time Hawaii real estate professional and a licensed attorney. And Leonie is a Hawaii real estate broker, a 20-year veteran in the real estate industry, and a board member of the Honolulu Board of Realtors. And our combined experience has led us to the show, Inside Hawaii Real Estate. So what time is it? It's showtime, baby. Today we're going inside Hawaii real estate with an inspiring guest speaker with a very timely topic. Our topic today is 1031 exchanges. We're going to deep dive into investment properties and how you can defer your capital gains taxes. And we have with us today the Hawaii expert on 1031 exchanges. That's right. We like, love to welcome Julie Bratton. So she's the vice president and regional manager of Old Republic Exchange Company, who we affectionately call Orexco. Uh, she's been in the industry, in the Hawaii real estate industry for 28 years. She looks awesome. And 22 <laughs> years with Old Republic Exchange Company. So I know that, you know, she pretty much launched this, uh, the company from its infancy stage. And just really excited to have her. So, um, Julie, welcome. Thank you for having me. All welcome right, there you are. Me. Yes, I've been in the real estate industry for 28 years in Hawaii. I and, moved. I moved yeah. to Hawaii in 1990, and um, from LA, actually. And I got into the real estate business in 1993. Right on. So I started selling real estate in 1993 for a short stint for a few years. And then I started doing a transaction coordinator program for a, a real estate company and then a title and escrow company. And then I, I fell into 1031 tax deferred exchanges. Wow. Huh. 2001. So it's been, it's, it was a good segue into 1031 exchanges, you know, knowing real estate, knowing what people need, but more importantly, why they need it has really helped me grow uh, my business in 1031 tax deferred exchanges. Oh, right on. You have the trifecta. You have real estate, you have title and escrow, you have the 1031 exchange. Man, yes. you know, wow. You know everything. <laughs> I don't know about that. But like I tell my son, I don't need to be right all the time, but it sure feels good when I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's anyway. why we're so fortunate to have you on with us today. And, you know, as we get into this 1031 exchange topic, maybe we could just kind of start with the very basics. Like, um, what are capital gains taxes? And what is a 1031 exchange? Okay, so... A 1031 exchange is a way to defer paying capital gains tax, and it's just for investment property. So if you sell an investment property and you have gain, it's taxable. And there's a couple of ways to be taxed. There's federal, which is 15 or 20%, depending on your tax bracket. There's a state tax. Many states in the United States have tax. There's a few that don't have tax but Hawaii is one of them. So seven and a quarter and above. And then you have depreciation recapture that's taxed at 25%. And then maybe the 3.8 affordable care tax. So uh, capital gains tax can really add up quickly. And that's why the 1031 exchange is such a popular tool. Instead of taking a chunk of your proceeds that you make, your profit that you make from selling your investment property and paying Uncle Sam, the IRS allows you buy this um, formula to reinsert it into the economy and keep your money growing for you. So I call it a free government loan. Oh, in my right on. Terms. So, okay, we're talking about investment properties and I want to even just take it even to the basics. So when you talk about investment properties, how would you define that? And it, well, the, the textbook definition is okay. in order for the property to qualify, it needs to be held for investment or for productive use in a business or trade. So Rental income is the best proof. So for example, if you have somebody who is renting a property 
for a period of time, it will most likely qualify. But let's say you have your friends or your family living in these properties for free. Hmm. Okay. If I owned a property and I'm letting my son live there for free while he goes to college, in my mind, I'm holding it for investment because it's appreciating over these years that he's in college, right? And then when he graduates, I would sell, you know, do an exchange probably so I don't have to pay uh, capital gains tax. That's right. But if I'm letting him live there for free or a dollar a month, am I using yeah. it for personal use or am I using it for investment? So the IRS wants you to prove your intent to hold for investment. So it's not a requirement to rent it, but I think it's a really, it's good proof. Whoever has a good paper trail of rental income and you're reporting it is probably going to be very solid. Okay. So. Wow. Okay. So in that situation, let's say you live in, you know, Hawaii Kai and then you own a condo unit near University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And let's say that no one's living there. So that could be considered an investment property. Yeah. You could say you're, you're holding it for appreciation, mm. but you know, why aren't you renting it? So, you know, it, there's no yeah. rule, hard and fast rule or bright line test that says you have to hold it for investment for so many days. You have to rent it out for so many days, but you need to prove your intent to hold for investment. Rental income is the best proof. Ah, Okay, so if so, let's say that you purchase as an investment property. So you said, do you have to hold it for a certain amount from the IRS and the state government standpoint? You know, that's a great question. And I get it several times a day. There is no rule or law on how long you have to hold investment property for investment. Is that You're, right? It's not measured by days, weeks, months, or years. It's all about your intent to hold for investment. I just like to say hold it for a year, <coughs> excuse me, because then you can clearly show on one year's tax returns your intent, how you reported one year of income to the IRS. But honestly, you can talk to 10 people and get 10 different answers. The longer you hold for investment, the better your story. Hmm. So I'll give you an example. Okay. Um, a few years back, I had a bunch of exchangers exchange into one of the new projects in Kaka'ako. Okay. It closed in January. Let's just say February 1st, three people called and they wanted to do exchanges. And I said, well, you know, you just closed on this property, you know, three weeks ago. You did not really hold it for investment. And their mindset was we did hold it for investment. Our money was with the developer for two and a half years. Now it's closed. It's in my name. I've made all this money. Basically, they're flipping it. And I want to do an exchange. I'm like, okay, well, you can do one. If you don't get audited, it works. If you get audited, it probably won't because you did not hold it for investment. In their minds, they held it for investment, but on paper, they did not. They don't bear any benefits and burdens of the taxpayer until they become one. And they had only became become one three weeks ago. So, you know, it's up to the client yeah. of what they want to do and what their level of risk is. But the longer you hold for investment, the better your story. That's great that is, to know, yeah. That is awesome to know. Why is it called 1031 exchange? I have no idea. The <laughs> revenue ruling has just a bunch of numbers and they assigned the 1031 exchange to this one. <laughs> but there was a landmark federal case back in 1979 called the Starker Exchange. So that was the first major exchange. And some, I think IRS did assign it a number eventually. And here we are with the 1031. And can you kind of walk us through just the basics of a 1031 exchange process? So you're saying, sure. you know, buying and selling or selling and buying and, you know, for someone who might be a first time investor or, um, <laughs> you, you know, if you could help us walk through that process. Okay, sure. So just so you know, there's four ways to exchange. There's the delayed exchange where you sell first and then buy. Okay. There's a reverse exchange where you buy first and then sell. There's a simultaneous exchange where you close your sale and your purchase on the same day. And then there's a construction exchange or an improvement exchange. So there's four ways to exchange. So the exchange that, that you're asking me to describe is pretty much the regular exchange. It's the easiest exchange you'll do. So if a client is selling their investment property, they don't want to pay capital gains tax. Once they get an accepted offer on 
their sale, they would contact me, the qualified intermediary, to set up the exchange. So what do I do? I get a copy of the contract and the title report, and I draft the exchange documents. And I get and everything gets signed. But the day that transaction closes is when the clock starts ticking. Okay, and the clock is really important. That's like the black and white of exchanges. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, yeah they let's have go 45, into that. Yeah. They, they have 45 days to identify in writing what they think they're going to buy and 180 days to close on it. So the 45 days is included in the 180. They don't get 45 and then an additional 180. So this clock starts the day they close. And 45 days is, can be pretty stressful for a client, especially in this market in this last couple of years. It's really hard to find a replacement property. There's multiple offers. There's, mm. you know, there's not a, that much inventory out there. So I'm always recommending for clients to start shopping for their replacement property early on. Don't wait till you close on your sale for that clock to start. Start shopping early. Okay. Anyway. And then is there a limit? on the number of properties that you could identify? Yes, so when you identify, there's two ways to identify. The first way, the most common way is called the three property rule, mm -hmm. where you identify up to three properties. You know, you might only wanna buy one, but a lot of people put more than one down just for peace of mind, because they're not sure what they're gonna get. Got it, got if it. you wanted to identify more than three, you automatically have to use what we call the 200% rule. And that's where you can list four properties or more. But the fair market value of the entire list combined cannot exceed 200% or double of what you sell your property for. So let's say you sold a property for 500,000 and you wanted to list more than three. So four or more. Okay. You can, but the fair market value of that entire list could not exceed one penny over a million. It's almost as if the IRS doesn't want you to go out and identify an entire neighborhood and then pick one later, <laughs> which it, is probably it. what somebody did. And that's why we have the silly rule. So, so, so it's the, the property rule or the 200% rule? Oh, the 200% rule is another level of exchange. That, that's like advanced 1031 exchange, well, it sounds like. I mean, let's say you have a client who's selling something for $6.8 million. Okay. And We'll, we'll probably go over this in a little bit, but to do to have a hundred percent deferral, you need to buy something equal to or greater than what you sell your relinquished property for. So let's say you have a client who's selling something for six point eight million dollars, a commercial building, and he wants to do some estate planning. I mean, he has five kids. Let's say he sells that six point eight property and wants to buy five houses, five single family homes, one for each kid. Mm. You'd have to use the two hundred percent rule. So. You know, you can sell one and buy 10. You can sell five and buy one. I mean, there's so many options. So the 200% rule is really going to come into play depending on, on the circumstance. It's not necessarily advanced. It's just what do they want to do with their money? You're a wealth of knowledge. This is like, <laughs> this is getting exciting because I'm learning a lot already. Hey, we're good. Yay. Julie, do you know why, why would the government allow people to avoid taxes? That seems like not a normal occurrence. So just kind of wondering. Well, it's a deferral of tax. It's not a getaway from paying tax forever. So <laughs> people can exchange, exchange, exchange. But once they sell the asset, they're going to pay the taxes. And when they pay the taxes, they're going to pay taxes on what they previously deferred. So let's say they did five exchanges into an asset. If they sell it, they're toast. They're going to pay taxes on the first exchange. So they really want this money to keep working. So as long as it's working, I mean, I think that's the best answer I can give you. Um, they, they want it to keep working. Otherwise, you are going to pay. I mean, what do they say? Death and taxes. <laughs> the end. So that so is an important yeah. part to know, right? That this is deferred tax. It's not like you're avoiding taxes. Exactly. So what some people do, I mean, they use this as a state planning tool. So let's say for the person who sells for $6.8 million and buys five condos or single family homes for each kid, if they hold onto these properties until they pass, then their kids will inherit them at a step up in basis. They won't inherit their, their dad's you know, capital gain burden. They'll have to pay estate tax, but they won't have to pay taxes on what they just inherit. So 
It just, it just really depends. There's so many reasons to exchange, but one of them is to diversify and leverage your real estate portfolio, relocate your assets. You can do an exchange anywhere in the United States, do some estate planning. I mean, there's a, a lot, so many benefits to an exchange. And it's one of the last tax loopholes we have. So, so we could just keep on be using, yeah. them, using it. So we could keep on exchanging until we pass away. Yes. And you talked about the step up in basis. So let's say that um, uh, my father, you know, bought a property for two hundred thousand uh, investment property. Now it's worth a million dollars. And you know, let's say he unfortunately passes away. At that point, can you kind of describe how the step up in basis works? So he purchased property like thirty years ago for two hundred thousand. The market value today is worth a million dollars passes away, passes on to theirs, and what happens? So it's my understanding, and you know, the laws can change all the time. Yeah. And I think they're actually trying to get away, get rid of the step up in basis once in a while that flies on, on the shelf. But <laughs> <clears throat> once a person passes away, you need to get an appraisal on the property and the person who inherits the property gets it at a step up in basis, which is the value that it's worth at the time of death. So if you sell it right away, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's gravy for you. If you hold on to it for a couple of years then, and sell it, then you'll pay taxes on the gain that you acquire during your ter term of ownership. Okay. So, I mean, people have to always talk about what their CPA, what those rules are. They're, they're sometimes moving targets. So in that situation, if you know the person had sold it, you know, from 200000 to a million dollars, that would be an $800,000 gain. And they would have to pay major taxes on that. If they sold be, it. If they sold it while they're alive. But once they pass, the step in basis, basically if the, the appraisal says it's a million dollars, then- Then you'll get it, it at a million. Then, and if, if you sell it for a million, then there's no capital gains. Correct. Interesting. There's estate tax to pay on the entire yeah. estate. Good point, yeah. But Yes. So again, these rules are, you know, up for negotiation these days with all the political tax stuff that's going on. So be mindful that that could change or there could be a limit on it one day. We don't know. Hey, Julie, can you exchange or do a 1031 exchange on a personal residence? No. So an exchange is just investment property for investment property. The only way that maybe you can mix it up is I'll, I'll give you a simple example. Let's say you're selling a duplex for 500,000. You rent out half and you live in half. As long as you're allocating it properly on your tax returns, you can do an exchange with 50% and take your personal residence on the other 50%. But you need to be reporting it properly on your tax returns. Got it. Julie, just to follow up on that, so can you rent like one room in a single family home? You and can, but it's your, you have, if you got audited, you'd have to prove your intent that it was a legitimate rental. Okay. So if you're letting your friends and family and kids live there for free or a dollar a month, it's probably not going to fly. Okay. Shucks. We were hoping that we could, you know, get our teenage I know with to... all your kids. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> That's yeah, kind of my big house for that. <laughs> <laughs> the clear message I'm hearing is it's a lot about intent and your risk tolerance, you know, in terms of like making sure that you're able to declare that it's a rental and that you have rental income and, and all right. of that. So, I mean, that's really important. There's time frames involved, right? That, that are super critical to selection or selection or identifying the properties that you're intending right. to exchange for and all of that. So intent, time frames. And there's, there's ways around certain things, but I guess, yeah, you have to make sure your intent is clear. I mean, every once in a while, I'll have a client call me and say, well, I did this before, I did that before, and it worked. And my response to that is, you know, everything works if you don't get audited. If you get audited, this might be your problem. And I really like to, to kind of go down that rabbit hole with the client just so they understand what the gray area is and then exactly what you said, what's their risk tolerance. I mean, I'm not going to let them do anything illegal. Okay. You know, but if they're doing something behind the scenes, I won't know, like move into it right away. Like you and I wouldn't know that. You know, oh, and, I see. Yeah. Yeah. 
And a lot of these things don't trigger an audit. They're a red flag in an audit. So almost everything is arguable. And it's my understanding that, you know, random uh, audits are random. They don't put you in a special stack because you did an exchange unless you're on some list probably, mm. but they don't really know you did an exchange until they open your books. But I do like to talk to clients about the gray area. So they just understand that if they got audited, this might be their problem. They should be prepared for that. I mean, you guys don't give tax advice. I don't give tax advice. We walk a fine yeah, line. Yeah. So we just have to, you know, be careful how we give our message. How and we always advise them to check with their CPA. <laughs> That's exactly. right. And you know what? CPAs are great. I mean, obviously they're, they're the ones who are going to give tax advice, but they do taxes every day, but they don't do exchanges every day. So sometimes they might be a little bit fuzzy. So I always, you know, my, my door is open, call, email anytime if you need a little extra information to give to the CPA so they can best or better uh, advise their clients. I'm happy to do that. So have you seen situations just kind of going back to depending, you know, each individual circumstance, if, you know, for if they had to move due to military orders or divorces or they lost their job? With um, if they have to move for military orders, I think they get a lot of exceptions, but yeah. I'm not sure if those exceptions translate into investment properties. I think it's more uh, their personal residence because okay. investments got it, got it. are passive. It's, yeah, they're not yeah. forced to sell those, but they're forced to move their personal residence. <coughs> so I think that that has their, um, that, that's the lane for military. Um, yes, when people get divorced and they separate the property, I usually have to ask them, is the divorce final? Or if it's final, then usually the property becomes tenants in common. You know, the wife gets 50, the husband gets 50, yeah. they can go their separate ways. So, you know, how people hold title matters mm. in an exchange. Um, so divorces sometimes are sticky. Sometimes they, they're not divorced yet and they're together and they own a property in a multi-member LLC or they own it in a family trust. In those situations, the entity owns the property, not the two of them. So they cannot separate as easily as they'd like to. So yes, I've, I've, I haven't seen it all, but I feel like I have. <laughs> something's, yeah, coming. Wow. something's coming around the corner. <laughs> and then, so what happens if you can't identify at least one property or within the 45 days, is it a done deal? That's yes. it? Yeah, you're toast. There's a lot of other expressions, but we'll use toast today. Toast, okay. <laughs> identify what you're going to buy on or before the 45th day, which yeah, we should finish the, I, the 1031 process. So you have to identify, we give the clients yeah. an identification notice that they have to complete. And when they fill it out, it needs to be complete addresses, you know, street number, street name, street, <laughs> Avenue, Boulevard, if it's a condo, it needs to be a specific unit number, city and state. I mean, it really needs to be the complete address. And they can make as many changes to this list as they want when they're in the 45 days, but on the 45th day, I need the final list of what they think they're gonna buy. So no changes after the 45 days. So if they don't identify anything in 45 days, because they just can't find anything, then they're toast. They're gonna pay taxes and they'll get their money back on the 46th day. Got it, got it. Um, okay. If they identify property and it's after the 45 days and they decide they can't get it or it falls out, then they have a failed exchange as well. And then they'd have to wait till their 181st day to get their funds back. So, you know, we have restrictions on when we can give the money back to the client, depends where they are in the time line of their exchange. And then basically they get their money back, but then they'll have to end up paying capital gains taxes. Right. So let's finish up with that process. So they identify property with me in 45 days. Okay. Once they open up escrow on what they're going to buy, I need to know about it. I need to get a copy of the contract and the title report again. And I draft exchange documents for that leg. So the money that I'm holding from their sale is the down payment for their new property. Okay. And they come up with cash and get a mortgage for the difference. And they have to just close it in 180 days. So let's say a client was selling one property and wanted to buy three. Yeah. Then they identified three properties. Let's say I'm holding $300,000. They can tell me how much money to put on each property. They could say $100,000 mm -hmm. on property one, $100,000 on property two, $100,000 on property three. 
And as long as they use all their exchange proceeds and bring it, get another mortgage or bring in cash to make up the difference for their purchase and they close these properties in 180 days, they'll have 100% default. So even if there's like extreme circumstances, whether it's military or like a death or, you know, someone passes away, there's no exceptions to 45 day identification period or 180 day period to close. Man, no they're tough. They Good are tough. Condition. Bad IRS. market conditions. I don't like it anymore. The developer left town. The dog ate my own mark. No, <laughs> unless we are a victim of the of a natural disaster that the federal government recognizes. We're oh. lucky here in Hawaii. We don't have any, but you yeah. know, Florida's got lots of extensions going on right now. Got it. Got it. Okay, so that <laughs> will be the only exception: natural disasters. Right. Which let me bring this up too. It, it's business. It's it's a. Uh, calendar days so if the 45th day lands on easter sunday they still have to identify to me by midnight easter sunday if 180 days lands on christmas then they have mm -hmm. to close on maybe the 179th day or the 178th day ah so that is really important so especially when clients are buying new projects they need to be really and if they're really coming close to their 180 days they really need to be mindful that they can close on 180 days and Julie, um, so if they're, let's say we're in escrow to sell the investor's home, but they're not sure they want to do a 1031 exchange. Can they tell the escrow company at the 11th hour, oh, hey, I want to do a 1031 exchange? Yes, they can. I can do documents <laughs> in 20 minutes if I have to, but I do need to get a copy of that contract and title report. And those documents need to be signed before closing. It can be uh, the day before closing, but got it. I, they have to be signed. Like they can't close on Friday and have cocktail party conversation over the weekend and say, oh yeah, you know, maybe I should do an exchange. I'll call Julie on Monday and set it up. I didn't touch the money yet. It would be too late. Too late. They have to got enter it. it in. They have to enter into the agreement before it closes. And, and then for anyone, you know, who might be interested in doing an exchange, are you able to give a range of costs and prices? Sure. So the regular exchange, we, we break up the fee in a regular okay. exchange. So the relinquished property fee is either depending on the sales price, usually 950, 1250 or 1500. Okay. And the replacement property fee is $575. Oh, okay. So relinquished is a property that you're selling. Yes. Right? Thank you. And replacement? the replacement is what you're buying. Got it. Got it. So you pay as you go. So if you don't buy anything, obviously we're not going to charge you the five seventy-five. Well, that sounds you know, pretty there's reasonable. A, there's, there is a um, there are people out, just general people out there that you know they go online and they read about the process of the exchange, and they come out with you know I need to use an exchange company. I'm not allowed to touch the money. They hold it, but there is so much work that goes on, orchestration that goes on in an exchange that they don't see like the consultation with the real estate agent, the client, the organization with escrow, we're reviewing entity documents, contracts, title reports, closing statements. Yes, we're holding the money. We, are, we have to handle the identification notices and audit those files. Then the replacement property, we're talking to a whole nother set of escrow companies, maybe uh, another agent, throw a lender in the mix. You know, there's so much or orchestration that goes on. I think people aren't aware of what happens behind the scenes. So no, that thank you for letting us know. Setup yeah. fee, that is why we have the setup fee. And then the re setting it up is a lot more work. So that's the fee. A, a reverse exchange when you buy first and then sell. Yeah. Then the price starts going up. I mean, it starts at $8,500 to do a reverse exchange. Okay. And can you just go over? So we kind of discussed the process for you sell investment property first and then buy. Can yes. you just uh, go into the basics of a reverse 1031 exchange? Okay. So a reverse is, let's say you have a client or somebody just falls in love with a piece of property and they would love to have it, but they have to sell <coughs> something else to buy it. That is a reverse exchange. You can buy first and then sell. There's two kickers in a reverse exchange. When you buy, remember in a regular exchange, the money I'm holding is the down payment for the purchase. When they come up with cash or get a mortgage for the difference. 
in a reverse, they don't have that down payment because the relinquished property did not sell yet. So the kicker is the client has to raise that down payment in cash. So sometimes they don't have that kind of money laying around, even though they'll get it back as soon as that relinquished property sells, they don't have the money to come up with. So sometimes people can't do the reverse, but let's say they can. Yeah. They buy first. In it, the IRS says they cannot own what they're selling and they're buying at the same time. So we, the exchange company, need to take title to one of the properties, either the one they're selling or the one that they're buying. So once we determine which one that is, the clock, there's another, the same clock ticking, but the clock is in reverse. 45 days usually doesn't matter. We know what they're gonna sell, but they have to sell that relinquished property in 180 days. Oh, okay. Wait, wait. can we just go back real quick? You said, sure. so you get title to a property under Julie Bratton? No, 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 no. <laughs> my, company takes, my company takes title to it. We have an, L, we have an LLC. Wow, that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> we have an LLC that we put properties in, or they can have their own LLC, depending on the situation, um, where we park the properties. Mm. And so we're just on title for the benefit of the exchanger. So when we're on title to a property, they're still collecting the rent, maintaining the property in the condition it needs to be in. They're negotiating the contract with the new buyers. They're paying their mortgage if there's a mortgage on it. I mean, they're doing everything as if they're the owners. We're just on title for the benefit of the exchanger. So it's more expensive because? Because we're taking title to a property we know nothing about. Mm. We put it into an LLC that we pay state and federal taxes on. There's an extra escrow involved. We need to be added on as additionally insured. So the plot really thickens on a reverse exchange. <laughs> None of that has to happen on a regular exchange. So from a fee perspective, if a client can sell first and then buy, that's ideal. Ah, so I have found that we have been doing a lot more reverse exchanges these days just because the replacement properties are harder to, to get under contract because they always know they can sell their relinquished property. They're like, let's just find the property first and we'll, we'll just pay the price to do the reverse because they don't want to be stressed out about 45 days. Yeah, and I would say with any investment property that you're buying, to save money on the capital gains taxes or, and, and to defer that, it would be totally worth it to do the reverse exchange. Right, I mean, people get, first of all, yes, again, from the fee perspective, if you can sell first and then buy, yeah. do it. But on a reverse exchange, when people go, oh my gosh, $8,500, I have to ask them, well, what's your gain on your relinquished property? Because $8,500 could probably be a drop in the bucket compared to what they're gonna pay in taxes. That's right. And if they find a property that's to die for and they have to have it, they should just at least know about a reverse exchange. I mean, they don't have to do it, but it is out there for them. And that's, it's just more complicated to do, but it's doable. You just have to sell that relinquished property in 180 days. Now, if it doesn't sell in 180 days, the good news is there's no tax consequence. It didn't sell. But now you have two properties you're servicing. Mm. And, you well, pay, and you pay the fees to try to do it. So people ask me every once in a while, is there a discount if I don't sell it in 180 days? <laughs> and I'm gonna, on that, I'm going to say no, because all of the same work is done. It's just at the end of the day, we're doing a deed. It's just who we're doing the deed to. Are we doing the deed to the exchanger or are we dropping a deed to the new buyer of the relinquished property? So there's no less work done. So people know how to sell it in yeah. time in 180 days. Everybody knows how to do that. They don't even have well, to have a fire sale in this market. I was just curious, like what happens if you change your mind and you decide like, hey, I wanna live in this replacement property, then what happens? Well, hopefully they can rent it out for at least a year, actually, the longer <laughs> rent it out, the better, and then move into it. I mean, no one says you have to rent it forever, but you want to maintain the integrity of the exchange if you can. So they should just talk to their accountant and find out how long, because again, there's no rule. It's the same question. Like how long do I have to own it as an investment before I sell it, move into it, change its use, give it to my kids, add people on time. I mean, there's just no rule. But if you're going to do an exchange and buy a piece of property that you eventually want to live in. If you want to make it your ever home, fine. You pass and the kids inherit it at a step up, right? But if you are going to 
uh, do an exchange, buy a property that you eventually want to live in and then sell it. So you can take your 250 or your 500,000. You can do that, but there's, you're not going to get the whole 250 and 500 and there's extra layer of rules to that. So, hey, Julie, you know, we hear about the like kind exchange. Can you sell like, um, you know, a vacant lot and buy a condo or buy a, you know, sell your apartment building and buy a single family home? How, how yes. does that work? That's a great question because like kind is a very misunderstood term in this industry. So like kind, although condo for condo, single family for single family, vacant land for vacant land are all perfect examples. It's really any combination of real property. So you can sell a single family home and buy a commercial building. You can sell a commercial building and buy a condo. Any kind of real property qualifies, any combination. Um, two things I like to point out with like kind is when you go from depreciable property, like a single family home or a condo, depreciable property, and you want to buy vacant land as a replacement, fine. You'll defer paying all the capital gains tax, but you'll have depreciation recapture to pay. And that's taxed at 25%. So if, you've owned, if you own that relinquished property a short time, it's probably not going to be significant. But if you've owned it for 15 years, it could be. Hmm. And also our state, we have a lot of leasehold. Leasehold property has to have 30 years or more remaining on the lease to qualify for an exchange. That's a great point. 30 years or more. So if you can remember anything, just remember leasehold property has issues. Make sure it qualifies before a client gets excited about selling or buying it in an exchange. I had earlier this year, a client, it was, it was so sad. He identified, he sold his relinquished property. He identified his replacement. Perfect. Perfect. Lovely ID notice. After the 45 days, I get a copy of the contract and the title report. And he had less, it was leasehold. And it was less than 30 years. Oh. And he didn't identify any backups. So not only does he have a failed exchange, I can't give him his money back until December 28th. Wow. No. I mean, Listen. it's on our instructions too. I mean, but I mean, I, he identified the property, didn't identify at least hold interest. I mean, I would have not, I didn't know. Yikes. Yeah. So just kind of be mindful of leasehold property. And sometimes leasehold property is attractive to buyers because of the lower uh, sales point. Salesperson. Of course, of course. Yes, we get those inquiries all the time. <laughs> so we have to know that it's 30 years or more. Has to have 30 years or more. And Julie, this has been like beyond 1031 Exchange 101. I mean, <laughs> yeah, wealth of knowledge. Up. And we could go on for probably hours. Like, you, you know, if this was like Facebook Live or something or YouTube Live, <laughs> man, you would get a lot of questions. I so, know. Uh, your callers or viewers can call or email me anytime. Oh, okay. We might have to put that up. Yeah. No, you've been so awesome. A any other final words about 1031 exchanges? Well, you know, it, it's a, it's one of the last tax loopholes we have, you know, and it's a great way to move your money around, defer paying capital gains tax. Hope, hopefully you're getting into a better, more, a better producing income property, producing property. Um, remember, you can do an exchange anywhere in the United States, the US Virgin Islands and Guam, just not Puerto Rico. And I have no idea why, but all the properties need to be within the United States. Well, two other things I wanted to mention really, can I talk about HARPTA and FERPTA real quick? Sure, absolutely. Um, HARPTA is the Hawaii state, uh, non-resident selling, non-residents selling property in Hawaii are subject to HARPTA, which is seven and a quarter of the sales price. But if they do an exchange, they're exempt. Wow. So Non-resident sellers on this call should know that. Mm. And foreign sellers can sell property, but they're subject to FERPTA. And FERPTA, they'll be exempt, but they're not exempt until the exemption comes in. So it takes longer to get that back. So escrow will collect the FERPTA mm. until that exemption comes in. So that's another topic we need more time on a little bit, but I wanted to bring it up because I'm sure we have both on this call. And now as uh, Japan's opening up and the, the countries are opening up and they're going to be coming to Hawaii to check out their properties, they're probably going to want to sell and FERPTA might be a topic of discussion. That's coming a on. And, point. Yeah. And, you know, just one exchange, like if we have brokers on the call, one exchange a month that you generate, that's like 24 transactions a year. 
They have to buy something, they have to sell something and buy something within a specific period of time. But it's a really great estate planning tool and way to move your money around into better income producing property. You are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so very much, Julie. You guys Jackson. are amazing too. Thanks for having me. VP and Regional Manager of Old Republic Exchange Company. Yes. She is the go-to person for 1031 exchanges in Hawaii and beyond. Oh, I have one more fun fact. Yes. So the Republic Exchange was incorporated in 1993. So it's almost 30 years. Next year, this coming year will be 30 years. I've been with Exchange, Old Republic Exchange for 22 of them. But we can say not we have not had an exchange fail on an audit for something that we have done. So we're very um, proud of that. Yes, and you should be. Thank you. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much again, Julie, for being a guest on our show, Inside Hawaii Real Estate. You know, that's, I mean, the one-on-one -on -one and beyond of 1031 exchanges. Thank you so much. Thanks for and having me, you guys. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for making the time. Absolutely, anytime. We'll see you again soon. Yes, we will. Very soon. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.